Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, depending on where you are, or maybe sitting, or maybe watching, because this could be recorded and be on YouTube. But welcome back to another one of our retailer webinars. My name is Scott Morris. I am the Director of Business Development for Gaming at GTS Distribution, which is the really long way of saying the board game guy. And we're here to talk about some pretty awesome board games. Uh, we're here with our biggest exclusive partner, Board and Dice. And we are going to talk about a lot of things, some of the things you'll see behind me right here in this little background that we've made. Uh, we're going to talk about Mandala Stones. We're going to talk about Origins First Builders. We're going to talk about Tabanusi. Uh, and we're also going to talk a little bit about Paladin Sleeves, which if you have not seen yet or have not stocked yet, I would highly recommend um, sleeves and supplies have been very challenged for, for just, you know, availability right now in the, the marketplace. Uh, as of right now, we're recording this on June 2nd, 2021. So if you're watching this in June 2nd, 2031, I'm hoping sleeves are a little more available. But <laughs> as of right now, they are pretty challenged. But we do have a pretty good amount of supply of these. And they are really, really awesome board game sleeves. So I don't want to steal too much of the thunder because I'm just here to do a short introduction and then take my face that was made for radio and go away. But I uh, want to introduce really quickly Rainer and Eirik. They're from Board and Dice. Uh, just as a quick reminder, uh, if you are here live, you can ask any questions you like by just hovering over the video window and hitting the chat bubble. You're more than welcome to uh, send a message to all panelists, or you can do a little drop down there where it says two, and you can send it to all panelists and attendees so all the other retailers will see your question as well. Um, as always, guys, don't worry about messing around with that. If you want to, you're more than welcome to, but I will monitor that and juggle that. And as questions pop up, we'll pop it up. I apologize greatly if everyone hears a dog in the background. Uh, my wife's dog has apparently decided to join the webinar today, so I'm very sorry if that bothers anybody. So I will put it on mute as I kick it over to Rainer. But Rainer, Eric, thanks so much for joining, and I will let you guys get started. Thank you for the invitation. Yes, thank you. All right, so we have a, a bit of a presentation here to uh, show to you guys. Um, and uh, what, some of the things that we want to talk about is we want to give you a little bit of an update on some of the uh, brand new releases which have just recently come out, as well as the releases that you will expect to see it later in the year. Um, so let's talk first about the timeline and update you on that. So both uh, Teotihuacan expansion period, which is the third and last expansion for Teotihuacan, as well as Mandala Stones, they have now uh, been released and are, are out right now. Um, Origins First Builders, which is a, a Euro game by Adam Kropinski. Uh, the scheduled release date for that is August, September uh, timeframe. And then we have Tabanusi Builders of Ur by Daniela Tassini and David Spada, which has an October uh, release date. And let's give you a bit of an update on Mandala Stone. So since we uh, last had a webinar where we talked about this. Of course, uh, Mandal Stones has since then been released and is available. Um, and it's doing tremendously well. And uh, I'm sure that's something that you can also talk uh, about, Scott. But we, um, we have uh, over 30,000 units sold so far, uh, 15 languages that are in print or in the works. And there are more things that we are in discussions with, uh, both um, in, in, of course, uh, North America and Europe, but also many other parts of the world where uh, we're bringing more partners on board for localization. And now what, what is this game? Well, if you have not stocked this yet or have not, uh, don't have this in your store, you really, um, this is definitely one that we would highly recommend because it's been so well received. It is a, an abstract strategy game that has beautiful, beautiful components. Uh, like the ones that you can see on Scott's background. Those are the, the stones from uh, Mandala Stones. Uh, you have um, a large number of the Ebonite discs. You have um, a very quick turn structure, very simple rules to learn where basically on your turn, you're either moving an artist to uh, collect stones or you're scoring stones you have previously collected. Um, as always, uh, there is a media kit and a rule book available. Um, and there's uh, a lot of other resources as well. Now, one thing that I want to, um, to just show you, and one of the things that is really appealing is not just the fact that um, the game is approachable and that, that it can be both played for people who are new to gaming or people who 
Um, it, this is a game that can also be played by, by gamers. This fits all different types of experience levels, all different types of, of lights. And it is beautiful on the table. The components are very clear and easy to, to use and to see. And especially with the, the stones, so the discs themselves, um, they have a very nice feeling to, to handle. So it's something that will look really good um, to, for, for demos, if you're running demos at your, in your store, um, as well as something that just uh, the ability for people to interact with the game, this is something that they will definitely feel that they are getting their money's worth for it. I um, mean, if you don't mind, Rainer, I do want to pop in yeah, with absolutely. On that real quick. So uh, first, yes, this has actually been one of, if not the fastest selling new release for this year. Um, as most retailers know, this has been a pretty challenging year in terms of timelines and schedules and shipping and things like that. Um, I was very happy to see that Mandala Stone stayed on schedule, which was awesome given all the the challenges between Chinese New Year and shipping and container availability, but we got, we got very, very lucky with that, which is good. Uh, but it has been in super high demand. Uh, We're more than likely going to be out of the entire first print run by the end of this month. Um, and we have a second print run already scheduled with board and dice. Uh, and we also are looking into the holidays as well. So we're planning on, you know, keeping that in stock as much as humanly possible over the course of this year and into next year, because it has definitely been received extremely, extremely well. Um, the, the other big thing, we have a lot of units that we can offer to retailers as review copies slash demo copies. So if you have a store that you're doing any kind of in play with, or you are doing any kind of displays with, as Rainer mentioned, this is a phenomenal, phenomenal game to be able to have on display because it, it's got that kind of Azul quality, right? It's got these like candy like pieces that when you touch them, it gives you that more personal feeling and, and this is my game and I want to take it home with me. Um, and they're very, very bright. These are, these are the, the pictures while they're beautiful, they really don't really do the justice of how bright these stones are and how, how eye catching they are. Uh, but if you do want to get a demo copy or a uh, display copy for your store, let your reps know um, as long as you're ordering, I think the minimum is three copies. We can get you a, a demo copy for your store. Um, if they, if you run into any questions on it or have any you know, questions you want to shoot over, you can always feel free to reach out to me at GTS. It's just S Morris at GTS distribution.com, but we definitely want to give you guys tools to be able to position this and promote it correctly with your consumers, because it's definitely a, a big time thing of once somebody sees it and once somebody touches it, they're, they're off and running with it. So. I will yeah, also you, in, uh, about about the the quality and the look of the game. Maybe not only the look, but uh, what we uh, also achieved with this game is this the sense of feeling when you are taking these stones from the stacks. You are here. You you hear these clicks. You actually when you I don't know if you remember guys or or if you watched um, any demos on Tabletopia. Tabletopia has this click when you are. Put, uh, taking some elements from the table and actually we were super um, surprised that when we opened the game you actually hear that click when you are taking these components so yes it's it, it will give your clients your customers this not only the look but also the sense the the, the feelings that this is a game which uh, which is nice and can be uh, easily um, taken to homes and, and the thing that is really appealing about it is that the rules are so simple. They are so simple and straightforward, where basically on your turn, you move one of the artists, which are the black markers on the board, you move it to a basically any empty space. You get to take stones that match that pattern. You don't take ones that don't match the pattern or any that are blocked by being adjacent to another artist. You place them on your player board, or if you already have stones on your player board, that you can score the stacks of, of stones that you have. And there's a very nice ebb and flow to the game where you are take, spending a few turns building up, uh, setting things up. You are rewarded for clever play where the, the order of the, the colors of the stones that get on your player board, that matters because that means that you can set yourself up for back-to-back -back turning, uh, uh, scoring, sorry. And it, the game rewards players very easily for, to, to make them feel clever for, for the, the plays that they're making. And again, the, the feel of the components, um, the 
the the luxurious feel of of the stones themselves that are large uh, and easy to handle um, as well. So this is definitely something that we uh, we're very excited that it's doing really well, and we will continue to uh, to push this to market this uh, and so forth. And you can expect to both see and hear more uh, about mandala stones in the coming months as well. Let's uh, talk about Origins First Builders, which is the first unreleased game that we will be talking about today. Um, and we have briefly mentioned this in the past, um, but let's go over some of the, the points for this one as well. So first of all, the pedigree behind uh, Origins, who, so, which was uh, designed by Adam Krupinski, uh, who has also designed games like Nemesis and Lords of Hellas. One thing that the game really manages to tie together is both an exciting theme, but also a beautiful and strategic uh, game. So this is something that can appeal to both Euro gamers who want the strategy of, of, of the, the actions that you're performing, different options that will both have an immediate impact as well as an effect on uh, the long-term strategy for the game, but it will also appeal for people who want a more thematic game or, so, or that are one to this. This is a, a board that is very vibrant, lots of beautiful colors, lots of things to feast your eyes on as you are uh, playing this game. Um, and one thing that is really, uh, really nice about Origins um, is the fact that it, it rewards both planning uh, by if you are planning to, for example, uh, as you can see, there, there's a recurring theme of five different colors. So there's the yellow, orange, red, blue, and purple colors. Mm -hmm. You are both rewarded for focusing and, and basically going after a, a certain color, both in the, the dice that you're drafting, which are workers, both in the buildings that you're acquiring to expand your city grid in front of you, as well as other actions that you're taking. But at the same time, you're also rewarded for variety. So the, the tug of war there between focusing on something and having variety for, for more options. Uh, it provides for a very nice uh, feel throughout the game. And it's also something that with very minor changes, um, for example, in the lower right-hand corner of the game board, there are three temple tracks and each temple track is associated with a Zodiac card that is different each game. And even something as simple as that, where basically the player that is the dominant one in uh, that particular track will have access to the ability provided by that Zodiac card. Even something as small as that will have a big impact on the actions that you're performing. It will give you new options um, and so forth. So again, this is a game that has been very well received. We've been uh, talking about it for a while. We have been uh, both demoing it during virtual conventions. So for example, uh, gamers that have been participating in, in various virtual conventions pretty much for the past uh, it's been over over six months now, so that, that we have been continuing to to demo this, talk about it, showed it to a lot of um, media um, and content creators as well, uh, just to make sure that people are informed about this. Um, and of course, you will continue to see more things. We have a a, a plan for similar types of contents that we had uh, in March and April, where we uh, sent out a lot of uh, review copies and so forth to reviewers and content creators. Uh, there were live play schedules. So we had, we had the same, we have the same plans for June and July timeframes leading up to the release of Origins First Builders. All right, now let's talk about uh, Tabanusi, Builders of Ur. So this is a game um, that this is um, basically every, every year in October we have, we, we typically have one release in the August timeframe. Uh, we have another one in, in October, which are both more of the strategic uh, Euro game genre. Uh, Tabanusi is uh, a game that you will, when you're, when you're opening it and you're looking at the components and so forth, you will recognize uh, some of the recurring themes and mechanisms that you have seen in other games. Um, so of course, it's building upon the same pedigree of both having Daniela Tosini as one of the designers as well as us as uh, the publisher to provide things that people will feel familiar with that when they are opening it, but still a very new approach to using that same type of component or that 
the same uh, types of, of mechanisms in the game. Here you have a drive drafting uh, mechanism uh, where the dice that you're drafting are multi-purpose. Uh, they both served as um, a resource. So when you're drafting a die, there are five different colors of dice in the game. When you draft a die, that die becomes a resource of its color. The value of the die that you drafted, so these are six-sided dice, that will determine which of the action areas that will, you will activate on your following turn. So you want to take a die with the right number that will let you activate uh, a certain area based on actions that you're planning on performing. But at the same time, that action area may not have the color dice that you, that you want because each area has the same color dice throughout the game. So you may instead want to activate a different area to get the resources that you need and so forth. So timing and, and how you're chaining together uh, the decisions that you're making, um, that has a big impact on the feel and the, the flow of the game. One thing that is also interesting is that as you're going through the different scoring phases, and there are five scoring phases throughout the game, those are also player driven. So you can purposely avoid taking dice from a certain action area. Don't, don't activate the actions within that action area. Uh, because every time that you do and a die gets taken, that basically runs the timer down for when that area will score. So there's a very nice feel of the players having more control over things. Do you need an extra couple of turns? Then you can do so based on taking actions in other areas to set yourself up for, for a more impactful scoring. Theme-wise, this is set in ancient Mesopotamia, uh, and Ur, the ancient city, was uh, located at what was at the time a coastal region. Of course, now it is uh, inland, and it's mostly desert in the surrounding area. But at the time, this was a, both a coastal region and uh, a location. It was near the mouth uh, of the river Euphrates. Um, this is also interesting from just the fact that this was uh, the cradle of civilization, so this is uh, historically a very impactful uh, area for, for the world history and the, the, the era of civilization. Game-wise, uh, there is, a, of course, a large board, and I will show on the, on the next slide, there's a large board that features the layout of the city. Uh, it was famous for both the, the large ziggurat of Ur, as well as its port, and then there are other regions where the, for buildings and shops and, and so forth. Um, in each of those areas, as you will see on, on this um, image here, so each area is associated with both a different number. So there are five different action areas. And each area, as you can see, there are ships that are docked at the port, and they have different, uh, different colors of dice. Now, some of the colors of dice, they are directly associated with the types of buildings that you can build, or different ships that are available, and so forth. Um, but you are also able to perform different actions within those areas to expand the, the gardens, for example, um, to um, acquire new projects. There's also a very nice mechanism where um, if Eric and, and Scott and I were playing a game, where maybe Scott and I were working on, on the projects for a specific type of building, but then Eric could be the one who completes that building. Now you might say, well, that's not fair that we have done the, the work at, ahead of time and so forth. But in, in, in some ways that benefits both of us. Yes, Eric gets to take ownership of the building. However, Scott and I, for the work that we performed on, we get other benefits. So sometimes you don't want to complete your own building because you want to get the secondary, build, the secondary benefits of having been part of laying the foundations for the building and letting other people complete it. Of course, you might want to complete the building for scoring opportunities. So there is a very nice flow of, while this is a highly competitive game, there is a lot of player interaction. There is not a sense of people coming in and stealing things from you or, or taking over something that you have spent a lot of time building up, but rather the sense of sometimes you don't want to uh, finish a building because that will help someone else. There's the an unwilling cooperation in that sense. But at the same time, you do, you're competing for both control over the limited areas that are available, completing, competing for the different buildings and so forth. And there are a lot of, uh, as you would expect from, from these games, there are a lot of different ways to both use the dice that you uh, acquire to uh, the, the different buildings that you're building. 
uh, the technologies and so forth, the other advancements that you can acquire during the game. So I would, I would generally say that if you like the mechanics from T-Line in general, like Teotihuacan or Tekenu, you will find all of this in Tabanusi as well, but again, as a um, delivered in a completely different package, in a completely different mechanic. It's combined in a way that gives you another feeling of a proper Euro put on your table and you can easily compete in a completely different way with a very well-known mechanics. So I think this is this can be a very good pick for a lot of uh, gamers who truly like uh, brain melting exercises. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, I, um, uh, I have a lot of people when we talk about the quote unquote T line of games that they, they start to realize, I, I think they don't realize how many games are in that line between Takenu, Tawantinsuyu, Teotihuacan, now Tabanusi. And they, they may not realize how well all of them have done. Um, and, and this is something that is, <laughs> this is the interesting part of my job. I get to see a lot of that stuff behind the curtain, but some people may only see it in their pockets or in their regions or in their areas where their stores are. Um, to put it in perspective, every single one of the T games that have come out have been bona fide hits. <laughs> so obviously T T Wakan has done extremely well. That's been out for several years. That has become an evergreen at this point. We've had some challenges this year in terms of shipping and being able to keep it in stock, but I am very happy to say that it is on boat and it is coming to us right now. So we are going to have that here by the summer, which is really good. Um, but the other games, uh, Takenu, Tawan Tinsuyu, these games dropped and a lot of people did comparisons where they were like, hey, how does this relate to Teotihuacan? Is it a similar experience? Is it a different experience? And I think for me, because this is my level of game, like I love complex i love different mechanisms that are overlapping each other and, and layering on top of each other i loved teotihuacan i'm really excited about o origins first builders just because i really love that theme but then i also love the idea of all the the different components coming together on that um but each one of these teotihuacan Takenu, tawantinsuyu now tabanusi they all offer that as Eric called it, the brain melting exercise, right? The, I, I, like, I always joke and I say, like a good Euro, the resources aren't there, right? Like you want to do everything and you can't, you, you, you have this grand plan and you're like, I just need six of this and three of this and two of this, but I can only get four of this and one of this and one, two of this. And that's the, the challenge and the fun of it. And it's really cool for me to be able to see not just the varying degrees of experiences that you get while playing these games that are all within this kind of quote unquote T line of games, but the fact that they all continue to do very well. Um, every one of these, you know, when we see um, people doing print runs, first print runs of games, the average in the industry right now is really only like about 2000 to 2500. Whereas these print runs are like more like double that, like just for us, that's not even including the rest of the world. Uh, they're, they're very, very successful. So this is something that, you know, not only we're looking forward to Origins First Builders, but continuing on this tradition of these T games, so to speak, which are really, really awesome. And I did a little Google just to, to check it out. You guys are nowhere near running out of T names for cities. Like there are thousands, <laughs> there's thousands of more options for you guys. Yep. Coming up, so. no, well, and I will give you a little sneak peek yes we will have another game with t city name inside yes yes <laughs> and, and one one thing that is uh, that i that i want to touch on as well is the fact that uh, if if you're familiar with the previous games so you might look at the board and say okay well i see for example in the upper kind of mid right area okay there are three temple tracks uh, you see okay here there are five colors of dice and you say that the color and the pip value matters and or here is a region where I'm constructing buildings and I have to compete and so forth. Now you might say, okay, well, I have, I've seen this before in a, a previous game. Uh, is there overlap in the experience? Is there overlap in, okay, well, it just takes different aspects and puts them together as a puzzle. And one thing 
I mean, this is something that we get asked uh, a lot. And a good way to look at this is imagine your favorite food, for example. For me, it's pizza. There are a million ways to eat a pizza, or even a million ways to eat the same type of, of pizza within that. Um, I, I can have experience experiences over and over where I there are familiar things that are that are put together. Yes, I like my crust a certain way. The deep dish is not pizza, but within that there is a realm of of flexibility, right? And, or take your favorite music, your, your favorite bands that may have put on, out hundreds of, of songs and each one is offering a different experience. So while some of the elements are familiar that you will see things, okay, well here I see three temple tracks. I see five regions and five colors of dice and you're saying that these are multi-purpose, but they are not multi-purpose in any way that we have seen previously. Here, the advancement for the temple tracks is not for immediate benefits. Rather here it is for, to affect the scoring that will happen later. Uh, here, the multi-use dice are not tied to, okay, well, I'm, I'm drafting something here and performing an action in this region. No, here, the value uh, of the die determines where you go next. We don't care about the value based on what you're doing in this region, because you're just saying I'm performing an action in any die that you do any action in this one. So even though we've seen similar things in other games like in Tekenu, in Origins this year, this is very much a very new experience each time. Uh, this is not a matter of just putting the, the mechanisms together in a new way, but rather saying, if you like these games, if you like what they do with the mechanisms, whether this be Teotihuacan or Tekenu or anything like that, this will give you the same type of experience, but in a completely different flavor. Well, the fun fact is also that this movement mechanic with include um, uh, related with the dice is very tricky because you want to expand in one area of the board, and then when you are when you are doing that and you are picking the die, then you are automatically automatically moved to another area for another round. So you need to double check if you can go back from the from that place. So this is uh, this is a difference between. For example, this game and uh, Teotihuacan, uh, this movement works completely different here and gives you another layer of planning and another layer of strategic moves you can you can actually do, or you can even block your uh, your different partners if um, if someone if you see that someone is trying to uh, compete with you in in the in the area you are interested in. Yeah. And, and it's also, of course, all of the games um, have different uh, variability to the setups. Uh, in Tabanusi, for example, there are individual player objectives. There are common objectives that you can complete. There are different scorings that you can do in the temple district. And there's also different setups. So you can have right now the basic setup, which you see here, where, for example, the brown, yellow, and white dice are associated with the three general districts where you have um, residential and shops and, and so forth. That's because then buildings come in those colors, but this could be randomized. So you could have that the brown dice are in the temple district, the white dice are in the port district. Yep. And, and the, that variability to things that really have, has an impact, not in complexity of, of what you're doing. It doesn't change any of the actions that you're taking, but where you need to go next. Okay, well, in order to, to complete a building in district one, because this is the brown colored district, but I want to complete a yellow building. That means that I need to go to the district that has the yellow dice first, and then I need to come back to the brown district where I can do this. And the actions that you're taking along the way, the timing and so forth. So this, again, this is a, a game that has that same quality gameplay, the same variety of strategic options wrapped inside simple mechanism, simple approach to the rules. And in fact, this is one of the ones that um, are a little bit easier to, to teach and to approach because there are repeat actions in some of the districts, but then there is a variety based on the choices that have been made previously that will impact of, on how you're able to complete those actions based on colors of buildings and so forth. 
now we also have a surprise. So as Scott was saying, um, obviously all of these games, they have been doing really well. And uh, because they are doing well, uh, there is also a, a, there has been for a long time, people have been asking, in fact, ever since the release, and I shouldn't say perhaps a long time because this, it feels like a long time because ever since uh, Takeno came out last summer, uh, this has been something that fans have been asking for. Is there something in the works? A few things have been teased about it, and now we can confirm that there will be an expansion for Takeno. This one is called Time of Seth. Um, Time of Seth, uh, just like previous expansions, so for example, if you look at the late pre-classic period, what that did to Teotihuacan City of Gods, it added a new temple, for example, it added a couple of new ways of approaching the game in uh, late pre-classic period, you had new uh, asymmetrical player powers. In Time of Seth, uh, there will be, first of all, there, is, there are new dice that are added to the game. So previously, there were four colors of dice that were tied directly to the, the four resources in the game, and then a fifth more neutral color. Um, and now there are two new colors, and they allow you to muster soldiers, and they allow you to gather priests. There's also an extra uh, side game board uh, that adds a seventh action, a seventh god action to the game, uh, a new way for you to compete with the other players of not just uh, control within that area, but also new, completely new benefits for uh, conquering neighboring lands, new ways for you to score, and so forth. But also because this one offers new opportunities, now it also it makes it more difficult for you to balance uh, the deeds that you have carried out uh, during uh, the game. So this is again something that integrates very well into uh, the base game. This is not going to require a, a complete shift in how you're playing the game. It's not going to completely alter the things that you like. It will just uh, deepen the experience. It will give you a couple more options. So very much um, the same approach that we have taken with other games uh, in the past. That is the approach that we're continuing to, to make. We're not just going to release an expansion just because the game is doing well, but we will release an expansion that is um, adding something that, that, is, that is going to expand the game experience for the players. Um, and typically this is by not altering uh, any of the actions or mechanisms, but rather giving the players choices and more things to, to consider. So more nuanced ways for planning your turns, new combinations that you can make with the actions that you had previously, and thereby also new ways to score victory points. The approach with this one, I would easily compare with uh, Teotihuacan, um, a late pre-classic period. Uh, exactly with the same what we did with the first expansion for Teotihuacan. I think it's it's very um, it's very comparable because you are receiving uh, a lot of stuff in this in this box. Actually, the box is uh, is very similar to the box of uh, late pre-classic period. Um, but what is important, you can choose what you can, what you want to add to the to the to the content, and you really feel that the added content gives you a proper difference, uh, expands your experience, and gives you another. I, I like to underline it that another layer of strategic decisions you need to you need to make during the game. So I think this is the strong element uh, which which pop ups. Uh, out of this box. And the modularity to the uh, expansion. So if you're familiar with the expansions for Teotihuacan, for example, there, there have been a number of modules that you can, you can play the game with all of the modules. If you know the game well, it works perfectly well that way and you can combine everything for the ultimate Teotihuacan experience. But you can also decide to add a few bits and pieces. You can add a couple modules. Maybe not every module is for everyone. Maybe you find that uh, you want to start with one, you find a favorite, and then you're slowly adding on uh, afterwards. The same is going to be a, a possible in time of set where you can uh, add new things. For example, maybe you just want to uh, play with the new set board. There are a couple of things that, that come with that and you can, you can add this and you don't have to do the other things. Maybe you want to expand the game and, and start playing with the asymmetrical uh, player powers that you have available to you. Uh, and these ones, they function completely differently from how they work in Teotihuacan. Whereas in Teotihuacan, the player powers that you have, they give you some 
new way of performing certain actions. Here, when you perform certain actions, you get benefits. When other players perform those actions, then you can also get benefits or they can get benefits. There are different ways that will increase the interactions between the players. Maybe I really wanted to perform a certain action, but I don't want Edict to have uh, the benefit from that. Uh, maybe you want to be able to unlock powerful artifacts, for example, that will give you uh, a strong one-time bonus. Maybe you want to play uh, with the new um, the, the new cards that are for, for starting resources and, and so forth. There are a couple of, of things that, that naturally work together, but there are also ways for you to uh, add this on piecemeal so that it's not uh, an overwhelming experience by adding too much at, uh, at any one time. And um, Tabitha had just asked, when is this going to be released? Um, we have not set it up in our system yet. This is something that is brand new and just being announced. So uh, we're just waiting on some final details from Board and Dice to get it set up. But yeah, I do I'm believe it's- my hand that this is my mistake. <laughs> I already prepared the data for Scott and sorry guys, do not shoot your stone. Do not throw your stones on Scott. It's it's my fault here, sorry. <laughs> That's I will okay. try to do my best to deliver all the data to GTS this week. So I hope you will be able to receive it pretty, pretty soon. And hey, if everyone's only throwing stones, that's a good day. So <laughs> I've had a lot worse thrown at me. So um, yeah, no, it will, it will be set up as soon as possible. But I believe re release time was later this year, right? Uh, yes. This is actually for Spiel 2021. Yep, so, so around uh, September. October, October time frame. So about exactly, the same time as... Exactly the same time as, as uh, Tabanus. So right. this, this uh, the same fright, the, the same delivery. So That's right, because they were on the same order that we had with Tabanusi. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Tabitha, I hope that answered your question. But yeah, it does, does look very, very cool. And then, of course, oh, as Scott... Uh, before that, so, sorry, sorry to, to hop in. Uh, before oh, that, fine. I wanted to refer to one more thing about the uh, T-Line games. Uh, I did a quick math, and in average, every game in the line has uh, around 10 language localizations. Um, this is the average because, for example, uh, Takenu is still below this number because we still didn't print um, some of the some of the localizations for our partners because of all those struggles with uh, with the logistics lately and the deliveries from uh, from China. Uh, but yes, this this shows that the game is is very popular. Uh, the, the games are very popular and has um, a significant audience. Uh, another example for Tekenu uh, in I don't know three months it uh, hopped in in top. 200 of board game geek so i think this this also shows that this is a strong brand and and i hope your customers will like it as well and then uh the last thing that we want to just uh, talk about as well is of course uh the card sleeves that we have uh the paladin card sleeves which of course are available right now through gts and um this is, of course, a line that has already several uh, years um, uh, behind us. That's been been tried and tested. We have a very solid and reliable production for it, um, where we we know that we are able to basically um, nearly on demand. We're able to to continue to print these and, and keep them in stock, and that that is something that we're continuing to ramp up and making sure that uh, the sleeves are are available. And they have been doing really well. Um, this is something that it, it previously uh, they were basically through uh, Kickstarter campaigns. Now this has moved uh, completely to uh, distribution. And um, we have uh, definitely put a big focus on making sure that, that, that the fans know where they can find these, that we are uh, continuing to support this, and that we're continuing to make these uh, available in all the different markets. And now we will, of course, yeah, go ahead, Scott. No, I was just going to say um, the bulk of these land in St. Louis first um, because we, we bring them in in large quantities, put them into St. Louis, and then disperse them out to Florida, New York, California, Washington, places like that. Um, if you're ever wanting sleeves and you don't see them in your warehouse, just I would highly recommend to check the primary main three warehouses for board games, which are Washington, uh, Missouri, and Florida. 
Um, I know, for example, like they're, they're a very high amount in Missouri right there. And uh, depending on your location, those can usually be hit within, you know, a day or two from uh, shipping time from the central U.S. So uh, I personally, I just personally bought a whole bunch of these. <laughs> like I, I went kind of a little crazy. Um, I, I bought like a hundred packs of these because I was sleeving two very big games. I sleeved Marvel Champions and I sleeved the Street Fighter uh, miniatures game uh, and phenomenal, just absolutely phenomenal sleeve. So uh, really, really happy with them. Um, we do carry the top 10 sellers right now. Uh, and if there are any that you see that we don't carry, please let me know. I, uh, Eric and I are actually in the process of getting the next uh, several uh, units that are, you know, top sellers and, and, you know, fast sellers in the marketplace and getting those brought into GTS as well. But right now, the main ones that you'll see in the, the SKU list are going to be the top 10 sellers. And one thing that, is, that has been very beneficial with this line as well is that uh, the, the, the first couple of, of seasons of the Paladin Sleeves which were funded through Kickstarter. One thing that we did from, from the very beginning was to involve the community in this. Yes. We allowed them to tell us what sizes do they want? What, what are they looking for? What, what's, what's the demand out there? Um, and we will continue to do this. We will continue to involve the community in this. And it's also been something that uh, e even though we did run uh, the Kickstarter, which of course there were a lot of people that were there and they wanted to get bulk orders in and, and so forth. We also had, even though they were not available in, in retail at the time, we had retailers that also uh, joined in on this. And even, even after a, a successful Kickstarter, then through, throughout the months, and, and we would, it was impossible to, to keep these basically in sufficient stock. Each time we would, we would overestimate, we felt like overestimate, um, how many we would need until the next season and there was the demand is continuing to grow and it's continuing to grow for us uh, really on on a global scale where um, they they have a reputation of a equality and a consistency that um, especially when it comes to uh, to gamers who often board games they will have um, a, a few card sizes that might be a little bit uh, unusual and difficult to find we try to have basically to cover 95% of all of the, the games out there. Uh, you're likely to find one of the sleeves that will, that will fit those. I can, uh, in the same time, I can assure you that we have a new production on water, on water right now. So the um, restock of sleeves should be available pretty soon. Also with these, uh, which are currently not available from this top 10 because uh, they can be out of stock. Um, and we are already planning um, the new uh, the new release because, well, uh, as Rainer told, the, uh, they are growing so fast that our estimations sometimes just just we are we are sold out uh, on water. So, well, I like to have this kind of issues, but still, I would like to do some better predictions here. But we put a lot of effort to a make this game a top, uh, make, sorry, make this product a top quality product. Because here, we, if we only see that there is any issue with um, any kind of, uh, of type of sleeves, uh, we are trying to improve and we are trying to make other release better and better, or we are, we are uh, even able to cancel uh, the model. And uh, the second thing is what, what Rainer said, um, is that we had we have the experience with with our partners with our partner who is doing the pr the production for us right now, so thanks to that we can be pretty sure that even if our customers will mix uh, the products from different different productions they will still look the same and for all of, for for a lot of gamers it's it's super it's super important. And even though these are new-ish to, uh, to GTS distribution, um, like Eric was saying, the fact that uh, these have been around for several years, what, what we did early on, uh, which is good because of, of uh, the, the recent pandemic and, and ongoing issues that way, uh, we would actually have someone from the company travel to China to help make sure uh, that the consistency and quality, the consistency in the in the, the materials and everything and making sure that we could get um, a quality and a level of, of standard that we uh, could put our names behind. 
<laughs> exactly. And also, this is the ch this is a chance to uh, release some additional models on the US market as well. So as Scott said, if you see that your customers are interested in any other models which are not yet available in the States, please let us know, let us know and this can be uh, changed uh, pretty fast. Yep, absolutely. Uh, answering the question, uh, how thick is the plastic? This is 90 microns in this. Yes. Seat. So it, it means that, I mean, they have basically a, um, a, a premium thickness without being, um, that these, these, they, the stacks, they don't, they don't slide around a lot. They, it's, it's basically a very good compromise between having premium quality uh, card sleeves and having something that is manageable at the table or for shuffling and, and so forth. Correct. And then, of course, we want to um, remind you, as always, of uh, the things that um, ho hopefully it is clear as we have these, uh, we conduct these webinars and we talk about different things that there, there are certain things that are um, really identify us in how we like to, uh, to conduct business, how we want to be available to you as retailers and to GTS as the distributor. One thing that is really important for us is the loyalty in these uh, relationships and partnerships where we know that we have um, a, a certain responsibility to carry and we want to make sure that you can expect things from us that are consistent in quality, consistent in experience. And this is something that we believe in heavily. This is something that we put our name on that we want to you to know that whenever there's a game, for example, that is by Borden Dice, that this is something that we have gone to great lengths to make sure that this is an excellent product in both uh, when it comes to, to gaming experience, to the theme, to the quality of the components and so forth. But we also don't want to become stagnant. We want to always, we're looking for new ways to innovate. We're looking for new ways to move forward, to be adventurous in, in the things that we do. We're looking for ways to take something that may seem familiar on the surface and adding a twist to it to always provide a new and fresh experience. We also believe in um, our responsibility to uh, act as a leader on in both the, the hobby and, and on the market and to, to do so through the way we conduct our business, to be by being respectful, by the way that we listen to feedback, by being accountable for the actions that we do, and for also recognizing the value of the partners that we work with. And in all of these things, we want the industry and the hobby to grow. This is not about just us trying to uh, figure out how we are making the, the most money in the next quarter. This is about a long-term partnership. This is where we want to make sure that we will be around long enough to invest in the future that we will have together, both with GTS and with you as retailer. And that's our, our goal to continue to move forward and to to do so in a way that we keep you informed, that we are accessible and available uh, for you in, in all regards, and that we always keep you up to date on the things that we are doing. And that- about up to date, about keeping up to date and uh, the last slide, guys, I want to encourage you to use the media kit link because inside we have, uh, we have changed our structures a little bit right now and also the way we approach uh, our new and upcoming titles. Uh, to every game, you will also find a professional photo session, uh, a product proto photo session, which is available for you and you can easily use that in your stores or in your webs or, in, or at your websites. Um, you can take it, you can use it uh, and you will always have the uh, most professional photos we can we can afford, and we are we are sharing this with you uh, in the in the name of loyalty here as well, and to give you a very good materials to work with your customers. Yeah, I, I cannot say enough good things about the media kit area and just the general support that Board and Dice offers, not just us as a distribution partner or you guys as retailers, but just the entire community as, as a large, um, you know, there are several different members of the team uh, apart from just Reiner and Irek here today, 
uh, and they do quite a bit, both on social media, through email, through interactions with everybody. They just do absolutely tremendous job. A lot of people ask me um, when I'm talking with publishers, they ask me, well, what are you looking for when you're looking for an exclusive partner? And my answer is actually, I'm not. <laughs> my answer is I'm, I'm not looking for many exclusives because the exclusives we have do so well that it's really hard to compare to them and it's hard to compete with them. And if you look at the very small amount of exclusive partners that GTS works with, we work with Board and Dice, we work with the City of Games, we work with Splatter. They're first all European companies in the UK or in the EU. They're not in the US. Very few of them have US representation. In fact, Rainer is the only person of all of our exclusives that is actually based in the US. Um, so we get we get to help you know, add that kind of, you know, feet on the street kind of mentality for people here. Um, but we look for people that have visions. We look for people that want to do more than just make a game or make a good game. Um, I always tell people that that kind of, you know, ship has sailed and, and that's not the ticket to ride anymore. You can't just make a good game. You have to be much more than just one good game. And that's something that Board and Dice has been doing for years now. And it's something we, you know, fully expect them to be doing for years. So cannot say enough good things about how you guys manage the business and handle the business. And we're, we're very honored and happy to be one of your partners. So it's very, very good stuff. Thank you, Scott, for that. And I need to admit that doing... Uh a cooperation with GTS for several years right now. It's a pure pleasure. We, well, we are not planning to change anything So here. So we want to grow together because this cooperation with GTS is not only a business cooperation. We are also a friend right now. And uh, what more, we can always uh, count on your help, guys. So this is, this is why um, I think a proper partnerships should be built, not only looking at what one time shot on doing only a sales, but building a proper partnerships makes a difference. Amen. And, and the other thing that um, I think we should also mention is that as we do these conduct the webinars, not only is the purpose of this for us to keep you informed on the timeline of the games and to know what's coming up, but we also honestly mean that we welcome your feedback. If there's anything that you feel that we can improve. We know that we're not perfect. We know that we have way, many ways in which we can improve. We want to hear from you. We want it to be easy to, to sell our games. We, we not, it, it's not enough that we have a vision or a brand identity. We want you to be part of that. Uh, this is not about, uh, about you selling our games. This is about us providing gaming experiences to uh, the people that play the games. So, so this is very much something where we, we want to hear your feedback. We want to, to know if you have ways that we can improve and learn that we can do better. We definitely want to, to know about that. Well, it's funny you say that <laughs> because there's a, there's a great question in the chat actually about this. So uh, Derek, one of our, our best retailers, he has a question here about the app for the Paladin sleeves, um, which he said it understandably contains a shopping cart for your web store. However, would it be possible to add wording about local game stores in there? Um, I'm not sure uh, if he's looking for things to either direct people to the stores, obviously, which would be my first thought, or anything that could, you know, be something where a store could sign up in the app to say, "Hey, we carry the store, we carry the sleeves," uh, or like a store locator type thing. So I don't know if you guys have talked about that or have any comments on that. Thank, and I want to thank Derek very much for this idea because right now. Uh, our uh, Paladin Sleeves app is available only for Android. Uh, we have the version for iOS uh, ready, uh, but Apple told us that we need to add some more functionality to that uh, to make it available also for iOS. And actually, this idea with this locator is something I would like to focus on. So, Derek, thank you for that. Derek, thank you for that. And you have my word that I will focus on this and uh, maybe I will ask you guys on um, on uh, board game industry channel on on um, on Facebook uh, how you would like to approach it, um, or for example to to have a chance to sign in and be be able to be listed uh, in the store, or maybe uh, we should we should connect directly with GTS and uh, and update the database. Um, for the name of the of the store, which uh, which carries our 
uh, our sleeves. So um, definitely awesome idea. Thank you for that. And, and I, will, I, I will dig a little bit more around that, uh, that idea for sure. And just so you know, Eric, um, most most of the the U.S. publishers that have any kind of um, store locator, um, a big big one that they use is a thing called locally.com. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I can send you a link to that. But I know several several publishing partners that have used that and done very very well with it. Uh -huh. um, and then uh, Maria Angela asked a question: uh, When can we expect Kenu and Teotihuacan expansion? Period. Restock the GTS. Um, we did talk about that earlier, but just to remind everybody, those are on the water. They are getting pushed over here as fast as UPS can humanly do things. Um, it has been a pretty challenging six months, pretty much since about December of last year to, to right now in terms of container availability, in terms of shipping availability. There's, I, We've literally, in the last six months, I've had discussions with uh, different shippers and different logistics companies about we don't have containers. We don't have drivers. We don't have an ability to get it from the manufacturer to the port. Once you get it to the port, we don't have the container to put it in there. Once you get the container, we don't have people to put it on the boat. It's, it's just been a calamity of like one bad domino falling on another bad domino and just kind of continuing like that. But we do have an order uh, for Teotihuacan to Kenu, Teotihuacan expansion period, Teotihuacan shadow of Shitla. Oh, basically everything in that T line is being restocked. It's just a matter of UPS getting that done. My hope, fingers crossed, and and everything goes well, is that by summer time frame here, uh, August time frame, we have stuff in stock. Uh, quite frankly, it's just really been a a big challenge around the the UPS and the logistics side of the business right now. Um, hopefully, again, fingers crossed and knock on wood, kind of thing. We've been told by our UPS representatives that things should start to smooth out once we get to that August, September timeframe. Um, I think the challenge at that point is that they're expecting Europe to see a lot of the, the pains that the U.S. has seen over the last couple of months. So we'll have to kind of see how that works out. But uh, that's a little bit probably longer of an answer than you wanted, Mary Angela, but I hope it at least answers and lets you know that, yeah, by, by summer, we're looking to have those restocked. So And, yeah. and in general, too, when it comes to uh, the release dates of the of the upcoming games. Uh, this is also the same communication that we have received from the factory, right? Is that there have been issues in the past. Yes, there are some of those things still lingering, but there's no reason to believe that any of that is jeopardizing the, the future release dates. This is definitely an issue that is being worked on. And part of that is also why we always have a, a a schedule of of things that is several months in the future so that we can do as much as possible to either lock down these processes way in advance of when we actually need them or being able to react and make adjustments uh, as much as possible. Sometimes, of course, we have we need to handle the situations which are like super hard. For example, uh, we didn't have a chance to get our November print sooner. Of course, I am speaking about Europe to get it sooner than in April 2021. And we are speaking about the production released in November 2020. Even though we've accepted uh, higher prices, still, even if, if you are accepting the higher prices, you have no 100 insurance that you will get the yeah. place the boat right now. So it's it's a hell of a ride so <laughs> that's, that's a great phrase for it i've, I've been telling people that uh, the logistics companies seem to be operating in what i call chicago business mode <laughs> um, we've we've had a lot of people tell us well if you pay this expedite fee or if you pay this rush fee then things will be okay and i'm like so we're talking about bribes here <laughs> like you know, it's, it's a little a little questionable, but yeah, no, it's, it's definitely going to be a challenge. It will actually, in my opinion, set us up for a very, very successful holiday. I, I think the holidays in the States for the industry is going to be phenomenal. I think we're going to have a lot of new releases, a lot of really, really quality games that people have been working on for a little while here this year and last year, and it's going to really set up for a pretty strong Q4, which last year's Q4 was really strong as well. So I, I fully expect this year's Q4 to be really good too, so... Awesome. Well, we are a couple of minutes over. As always, we have talked about a massive amount of stuff here and awesome stuff. Um, if you have questions, by all means, retailers, you can reach out anytime you'd like. You can contact me directly at smorris at gtsdistribution.com. Uh, Rainer, what's the best way for people to get a hold of Board and Dice if they want to ask you guys questions directly? So you can either email uh, either of us directly. Of course, uh, 
Eric is the best one for things that have to do with sales and, and distribution and, and so forth and the availability. And that's just Eric at boardanddice.com. If you have questions specifically with regards to the games, do you want to know uh, how to talk about these games in your store? You want to know how to market these or, or find resources that way? You can always email me uh, at rainer at boardanddice.com. Awesome. And I just put those in the chat. We'll make sure to put them on the, the video as we post it to YouTube. And if you're not here live and you are watching this on YouTube, by all means, feel free to leave a question below in the comments. We'll get your answers over to you. Uh, and as a reminder, uh, retailers, if you're ordering Mandala Stones, ask your rep, get a display copy, get a demo copy in your store. It will do just massive amount of work for you on its own, just, just by being put on a table, which is awesome. So, well, gentlemen, as always, it's a pleasure to see you, my friends. You're both in, in Poland. You're not, Rainer's not here in America. He's flown yeah. overseas and he's going to be, um, he, we talked about it before we went live. He's working uh which means he's playing a lot of games over in poland <laughs> so yep. but, uh, travel safe we look forward to seeing you back in the states here soon thank you all for joining retailers thank you for taking the time i know it is absolutely crazy right now so i really do appreciate y'all taking the time whether you're here live or whether you're watching this on youtube uh and until we see you next time have a great week in your stores and thanks so much take care thank you very much take care